before we do anything else, uh, I want you to pretend this stage is a scale, uh, and I'm going to be the slider, OK? Uh, the next thing you need to do is, if you've got a hot drink, or a phone, or a glass uh, in your, in, on your lap, can you get rid of it? Because otherwise we could run into some health and safety issues. Uh, so just make sure you're unencumbered. This is not an excuse to get you off your phones and laptops while we, while we do our speech. All right, so I want you to think about the following question. I want you to think about, in your organization, um, how ready are you to face the challenges of new competitors entering the market, of disruption, of uh, the new uh, desires of talent that enters your workforce? How ready are you? Um, and let's, let's do it over a, a reasonable time frame, so five years. In the next five years, are you going to be, are you well tooled to respond, right? And here's the scale. At this end, this is zero. This is uh, disruption, what disruption? Or uh, I'm sort of pretending it's not there. It probably won't happen to us, hopefully not, right? At that end where Christine is, that's 10. And that is, um, and given this has been used continuously today, that is, Yes, we're going to Airbnb our market. They're not going to see it coming. We're definitely going to win hands down. We're going to disrupt everybody else. We're totally ready. OK, zero, hopefully it won't happen. Or what do you mean disruption? That end, we're going to, yeah, we're going to Uber it. OK, does that make sense? I'm going to walk along. And as I walk along, I want you to jump up, because you spent enough time sitting. I want you to jump up, and I want you to shout, Porter, uh, mainly because he's on next. See, look, it's woken him up. <laughs> uh, Yell Porter when I get to the number that represents where your organization's at, OK? 0, 10. Has everybody got the exercise? Sort of impromptu market research meets keeping the audience awake at 3 o'clock. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to start walking. Just jump up and shout when you're ready. Don't worry if you're the first to jump. Sometimes people wait, and like, everybody yells at 10. <laughs> that doesn't work very well. Just be honest that way you're at. OK, 0. I'm, I'm starting. That 1, 2. Three. Oh, you're pretty ready. Oh, yeah. Four, four five, five, six, five, six, six, seven. Oh, eight, eight, nine, ten. There, just one. All right. <laughs> Who do you work for? <laughs> Who do you work for, madam? Sorry, sorry. I just, I was interested. Who is it? And where do you work, Lucy? Uh, uh, oh, there you go. Same. Yeah, yeah. You are Ubering somebody. OK, all right, <laughs> good. Um, so I think partly because you didn't want to speak first, and partly because I think it's about, it was about five, wasn't it? Mostly. That's where most energy was at sort of five. And I think that's probably about right. That's probably about where most large organizations uh, feel like they're at. And, and so, look, what we're going to do is we're going to not mainly because I don't think we've got lots. Well, Christine might have some. We're not going to talk about lots of clever science. <laughs> We're going to tell you a story about trying to do this for real and tackle disruption and shift an organization. Um, we're going to spend the next 20, 25 minutes doing it. Can we have our Here, slide? You've got the... Oh, I've got the thing. Sorry. Atif, can I have our slide? Yes, you can. Uh, OK. <laughs> so, and I guess what I'm talking about is this, right? So most organizations find themselves on the left. That is the world of scale and efficiency. Um, it, you're maximizing your business, make sure it's big enough that you've got enough efficiencies of buying that you can get your margins up. Uh, you make sure that everything's done as quickly and efficiently as possible, that gets your margins up. It's worked beautifully for about somewhere between the last 20 and 50 years in the world of business. Um, what businesses need to try and do is shift over here. Uh, and I guess I'd call this energy and experimentation. Your customers needs to feel energized by what you do. You can't give them lazy offers in the market. Well, your people need to feel energized by what you're saying this business is about and where it's headed. They're not going to just accept command and control any longer. Um, and so I guess you know, if that's about solidity and numbers and uh, making very rational decisions based on the numbers available to you, this one's about agility and it's about judgment. Uh, and it's a very different way of operating. And, and I think that's why most businesses are feeling five out, five out of 10 ready, because that's a material shift. So that's what we're going to talk about. Do you want to click or yeah, shall I yeah, click for you? Yeah, you can click. Yeah. All right. I'm going to hold on to this from now yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit about a few. This is kind of what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about new versus old. You know, a lot of what 
you guys have been talking about, and interestingly enough, the individual who said I'm 10 was a startup. There's a very different dynamic when you're talking about talent, organizational behavior, change, outcomes, when you've got a clean slate versus when you're working on something that's really old, okay? We're gonna talk a bit about dealing with real. You know, everybody's got sort of playbooks, and they'll tell you, hey, if you do this first, then this first, then that second, third, fourth, that'll work. And the reality is that what we found was is you had to start wherever the organization is. So we'll, we'll speak about that. We'll talk about a narrative, and a team's gonna challenge our thinking around sort of an analog thought process versus something that's much more iterative. Talent, and what does the role of people play? It was fantastic to hear um, the previous speaker, Dr. A, talk about emotions and control and management of emotions and how organizations, you know, how individuals respond in an emotional way. Well, organizations do the same thing, and they're just a responsive, a bunch of individuals moving. So how do you look at talent differently? And then finally, what are some of the principles that we learn in this journey? So we don't have a rule book, a playbook, but we'll just share with you some of the experiences that we went through. All right, so some numbers. So I like to start with the end. So this is the end of the story. Well, it's 2014, um, we're in 2015, and I will tell you that our numbers are, are getting better. Okay, we just did our AGM today, actually. I was there this morning and came over here today. Um, 2013, uh, culture, we have a, 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 a an assessment, a profile thing that we use, it's called the Barrett Culture Values Survey, a number of folks have used it. And it gives you a cultural disorder measure, which is basically a measure of fear in the organization. So how much time are people navigating, all right? And we moved, sorry, oh gosh, wait. I apologize, I'm looking at these numbers wrong. Um, we moved from, this is different, sorry, you, you guys changed my titles. Pride was from 61% to 75%. So we moved the, the uh, organization's sense of pride from 61 to 75%. They gave me a culture number, not my cultural disorder number, or they flipped it. I think they flipped it. It went from 32% to 22%, okay? So they did flip my slide, so I apologize. So we moved 10 points over this period of time, which is a significant movement. Engagement moved nine points, trust, in senior level executive moved 18. So when we started this journey, the organization did not trust the organization at all. The executives, the leadership, they were very, very frustrated, very disappointed. The customer metric, so we moved from customer RMPS scores, customer engagement from 33% to 50%. So we really wanted to make sure that this isn't just about the people, it's about the people driving outcomes and moving the organization. Financial performance increased, share price increased. And we're at, a, we're, at better, we're at a better number than that 485p today. So that's, that's, that's good news for our shareholders. So these are the numbers that we wanted. And as I said, it's one thing when you're starting to move an organization that's brand new. It's a clean slate, it's pretty. You can see where, the, where all the, the, the dirt might be. You can see where, where, where the challenges are. You can see where the behaviors are. The challenge is, is most of us get this. Right? So I started with a 300-year-old organization. So Aviva is over 300 years old. It's an amalgamation of uh, CGNU, which is uh, at Norwich Union, and a number of other organization acquisitions. And we had to figure out, OK, what's at the frame of this? And how do we start to solve this? And how do we start to move the organization forward? All right, so that's the, that's the backdrop from which we're working with. So let's talk about this one. So I'm going to start. Yeah. The cost reduction monkey. So how many of you know that you're working through a transformation and one of the biggest things that you immediately get told is, is we've got to get a number, right? So our number was 400 million, all right? We had been set by our chairman a, a target and a goal that said we had to take 400 million worth of costs out of this business within about 18 months. It really was 12 months because we had to get a run rate within that first year. Now at the same time they said, all right, the, the board said to me, well, you're the HR person, you need to figure out how to fix the culture and the values of this place. So 400, 400 million cost cutting reductions, and oh, by the way, we're gonna make everybody feel much better about being here. Okay, so the challenge was, how do you start with that? Because you have to solve that, even when you'd rather start with a whole lot of other activities. You'd rather start with offsites and conferences and all these wonderful sort of uh, programs. Well, we didn't get a chance to do that. So um, Atif worked with me to come in and start to solve the problem that needed to be solved immediately. And part of it was our operating model. 
We had been cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting, but what we didn't know was how to actually make the organization work. And so even though that wasn't the starting point of the culture transformation or the organizational transformation, it was a necessary point at which to start. So the way in which we approached it was to look at it a bit differently and actually start that operating model conversation at the customer. All right? So. Uh, so the next, so that's reality number one. The, oh, thank you. I was off and I'm back. Um, was we had to solve the cost reduction problem. Um, the second reality was that we knew that at the end of this journey, and many of you would have been there, there would be a moment of truth. The moment of truth would be the first time a leader from that group executive stood up and told everybody what this organization was now going to be about and how we we're going to move forward. Right? And we all know what happens. People look in the whites of their eyes and they make a judgment then and there whether that person means it. And if they don't mean it, you're dead then. Forget two months later or six months of the comms program, whatever. It's over then. They know that the group exec don't really mean it. So we knew we had to get them to build the story. And uh, Christine and I were just reminiscing, because this was June 2013, and basically, uh, within about 10 minutes of the first session, we had a full-scale group executive rebellion on our hands, right? We had, like, why are we spending time on this? Why are we here? Why do we need two days? What's this process? Who's that guy? Uh, <laughs> all of that. They all still of ask that, that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and actually, I mean, what I, you know, how do we get through it? We needed Mark Wilson, who was the CEO at the time. We needed him to just be willing to trust the process. In fact, trust the process became a bit of a standing joke because you had a load of very left brain insurance executives who really wanted to get into the process, rip it up, tell us it was shit, and then start again. And, and, and we just had to keep going, trust the process, and kind of get through it. But actually, if Mark, back to I think Alan made this point earlier, um, we're a primate species. Everybody looks up. Uh, if the CEO doesn't mean it and isn't personally taking ownership for it and going to do it himself, it's not going to happen. Uh, so that's how we got through that. So, and, and, and a critical component on, from a leadership standpoint and, and, and a development standpoint was that if these folks, if we, myself included, as a group executive member, were going to carry the organization through the amount of extreme change, which created a lot of pain, if we were going to carry that through, we had to actually, it had to be ours. So it couldn't be a TIF, it couldn't be some other, ex, you know, consultant from the outside, it couldn't be some other company, you couldn't call McKinsey in and have them do it. We actually had to do the work ourselves, because if we did, then it would be ours, then we could carry the rest of the 30,000 employees through that process. But if we didn't, we would not have been able to. So the top 100 have to wait. Part of the journey here was, you know, we were joking around earlier about this experience, was actually having the group executive. We went off-site probably four or five different times for a day to two days each time to actually do the work. Now, as a, as a human resources professional, you know, that in and of itself was transformational, right? To get that amount of time for this group of people to spend together to work through customer experience, customer um, desires, what is our purpose, where are we going, the values, et cetera, et cetera. And as we made breakthroughs, there's an immediate reaction that most executives have, and I do it myself, which is, I have now had a brilliant idea, we have all come to a wonderful conclusion, now I'm going to share it. Right? Immediately I'm going to tell, because if I've come to a great idea and I've come to a great outcome, then my first thing is communicate, right? We love that. We're going to communicate this great vision and everyone's going to be there. But the challenge we had is, is that we needed to bring the organization with us, right? There was a fundamental belief in this process that we had gone through a series of experiences that got us to that aha moment. And it took us four times off-site, meeting with customers, you know, getting out in the market, looking at competitors, looking at all these. And we knew that if we just went out and said, ta-da, here it is, that our, our constituency, our leaders, that top 100 group of folks who are going to have to lead this across the organization, well, then they didn't have any skin in the game. So while we did our realization, we never quite finished it before we engaged that top 100. So we challenged ourselves and we went back, even though we weren't quite done, which is also, I think, an executive challenge, right? For all of us, we think it needs to be perfect when we go out there. But before it was perfect, we engaged that top 100. And we started to bring them in, but we didn't do it as a ta-da. We did it as said, here's what we're thinking about. What do you think? And gave them an opportunity to engage in it, but not as a big transmit. Uh, so next reality is uh, we then went to the next 300, and actually that was 200 further senior people, but then also some people from the front line and from the grassroots who were influential and people to pay attention to. And, and the thing we knew was, to Christine's point, that we couldn't just cascade stuff at them. 
Uh, in fact, we found out on the night before this event, we had 25 facilitators that were Aviva people ready to go to, to engage everybody else. And um, they were being briefed the four hours before this two-day event was due to start. And basically, they, they <laughs> walked out of it going, I mean, you'll hear some of it on a video in, in, at the end, what is this shit? <laughs> uh, what are these words? Where do they come from? We don't like them. They feel aggressive. They feel negative. We're not sure. Da, da, da. And then they went away overnight, and they came back in the morning, and they were like, I should have slept on it. And I think it's going to be more meaningful because it's got edge and it's, it actually means something versus being words like integrity and courage, you know, all the words that appear on, uh, on walls in offices uh, during these processes. And, uh, and, and, so, and so we designed um, this and actually the next stage so that really two things happened. People got to explore. So actually we created fold-up boards that were mini exhibitions of all the different bits of thinking that the, the group executive had done. And we allowed people to just walk around them, plug in some headphones, and then we allowed them to get together in groups of 100 and have a 100-person conversation, which, believe you me, I didn't think was possible until the first time we tried it. Uh, and we just allowed them to talk about it and go, well, I don't understand, I don't get that bit, and I don't like this bit. And we allowed that community of 300 people to start figuring out for themselves what this was and what it might mean for the business, what it might mean for them. Uh, and by the end of that, I mean, again, you'll see it, on, don't trust us, or the numbers, you'll hear it on a video at the end. You had people you could see being go, okay, this is like a real thing, we mean it, and I'm beginning to feel like it's mine and I should do stuff with it. Yeah, and I think the challenge for us in particular, and again, every organization that goes through these kinds of transformations have different issues to solve, but there was a fundamental problem that we had had around the fact that as an organization, we'd been incredibly hierarchical, incredible paren incredibly parental. So we'll tell the front line what they need to know, when they need to know it, if they need to know it all. This isn't an adult, adult relationship. This is actually, we're really smart. We sit in a room at the top of a building, and we'll come down and we'll let you know where we get, when we get there. And so the actual act, you know, as, as a team challenged us to start to think about creating different spaces, that, that, that space that we used for that 100-person conversation, the act of allowing our frontline people to sit in with our executives, which you think, well, that doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. It was. The actual act of allowing people to say, you know what, I don't like it, it doesn't work for me, I'm uncomfortable about it, and senior level executives who facilitated it to say, okay, tell me more about that. Not, well, you better find the exit because we're gonna, you know, you're leaving. The, the conversation and the change in the dynamic was a really critical part of engaging that whole organization in order to get the whole organization to shift as opposed to the top just cascading information down. And then finally, it was this conversations everywhere. So one, we took the group executive, then the top 100, then 300, that was a mixed group of frontline and leaders from across the organization. And then we actually allowed that 300, we encouraged and, and asked and, 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 and empowered that 300 group of people to then share that message to 30,000. And it wasn't managed by a human resources learning team, it wasn't managed by um, a communications group, it was actually leaders in the organization having conversations around these topics, around these issues, around these challenges. And it was through that process that we started to move the, 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 uh, the conversation. Okay. okay. So, um, so what was it, the stuff? What did we come up with when we were working with the group executive? So I just wanted to contrast, I guess, what I think doesn't work. Maybe it worked 50 years ago. I'm not sure it even worked then. It definitely doesn't work now, which is this, where uh, you do a strategy project, the strategy team do it, they do it with McKinsey or somebody. Uh, at the end of it, you have a massive mound of paper. There's good stuff in it, but there's like multiple of these decks and very few people in the organization actually understand the content of those decks. Separately, there's a team over here going, what's our vision or mission or goal and how do we come up with that? Let's make sure it's really inspiring and it's gonna unify the troops and be fantastic. And then eventually it gets put on a wall. Uh, and then there's a third team over here going, I'm, you know, I'm deliberately, you know, uh, being proactive, but there's a third team going, okay, what kind of culture do we need to build? And the danger is that this third one becomes what kind of culture would we like to work in, not what kind of culture do we need to deliver the strategy that we've just put in place. And so what we did, and sometimes they're more or less siloed, and I guess what we did was not this. So, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, and again. So what we did was we got to this, which is we kind of went, look, what are the, to, again, to Al Underbottom's point earlier, what are the big questions that we need to figure out? We need to figure out where the world is going. We need to figure out what our role is in that world and for our customers. What's our strategy? What's the plan of action that's gonna deliver that strategy? And what matters here? What kind of culture are we gonna to need to build if we're gonna go after that purpose and that strategy? And we worked in those four sessions with the group executive using stimulus, bringing in customers to answer those questions and to constantly check back. And so I won't go through them all, but 
when we did the work on where the world is going, we brought in people from other businesses, from uh, other people that looked at cars, so car manufacturers, or people like Samsung who were looking at um, how they could uh, take the space of entertainment in the car, or people around the health issue, areas that Aviva worked in. And we got them in a room with the Aviva exec, and we said, you're going to basically argue out what you think the future is going to look like in 10 years' time. And then the Aviva exec sat down and went, okay, of all the things that we came up with as a wide group, what are the five or six things that are going to affect our business, our industry? We got, as, as Christine said, we got, customer, we got customers in to come and uh, meet the exec. We, we actually told the exec they were going to role play, and then once they finished role playing, we told them it wasn't a role play, they were real customers that they'd been playing, and then we brought the customers in, and then we demonstrated the gap between you know, what they had got right and what they hadn't. And we used that as stimulus to go, well, so what is the purpose? You know, we've got all these different divisions. What's the purpose of this business? And we got to, we free people from the fear of uncertainty. So whether you're managing a big investment portfolio or whether you're managing somebody's car insurance, you are freeing them from the uncertainty that would happen if they didn't use your services uh, and allowing them to go on and do exciting things and move forward in their lives. Um, we tested that strategically as well and said, look, this isn't just a nice set of words. What do we have to do to our business if we're going to become a free people from the fear of uncertainty business? Fast forward to 2015, we're working now on uh, what is the future of car and home insurance uh, and, and, and how do we deliver that? We free people from the fear of uncertainty in the insurance market. If we do that, we're fairly sure we'll leapfrog our, our competitors. Um, and so on. I mean, I, I think you sort of get the idea. I could go on and on, but I won't. Um, uh, so I think, I think the, the, the other the piece culture, of this yeah. that you spoke to a little bit earlier that I just would like to highlight is, is that the, all through this process, we were under significant pressure from the board, as I said, to, to change the culture, to fix the culture. Our engagement was quite, quite low. Um, we had significant cost reductions we were driving through. And there was a sense of, well, you just need to roll out a new set of values and a new purpose. You just need yeah. to roll that out and you need to get the organization going. But what we did last, and again, this was last and quite purposefully last, was to do the values. So after we had the purpose and we knew that within the context of where the organization, where the environment was going, we then went back in and we did a series of mirror exercises with, with employees to understand how they viewed the organization. We had all of our engagement stuff. I wish we had that emotion piece that Dr. A had. That would have been fantastic. But we surveyed and we assessed and we evaluated and we brought all this information back so that the executive could look at where are we really today and what exactly is this organization? What do they see? And what do they see about our behaviors? And then we came through this process. We took a lot of feedback from our folks around what they wanted without the context of the strategy and the business, but what kind of culture, what kind of values did they want across the organization? But it wasn't until we had the strategy landed that we could then go back and land the values. Because the values had to go in service and had to go in partnership with the purpose and with the strategy of the business. Because if it didn't, it would have been something standing over here, separate from and not connected to what the organization needed to achieve. So we came to these values, and actually it was quite interesting because the process of getting to the values was very argumentative. We really struggled because some of these things you'll hear are very edgy. So care more, that's good, right? People like that. That feels like care more, customer, integrity. So we like that. But in the definition of care more is about actually we do one step further. If you think this is good, go one more. Right? We care more than just the next guy about our employees, our shareholders, our customers. Never rest. Never rest. Imagine going out with a value called never rest to a group of employees when you've just made 2,500 people redundant. And they're looking at you going, never rest? What are you? Like, I don't rest. I'm working like crazy. I'm frustrated. I'm... But never rest was about making it better. Don't sit back on the status quo. Don't let yourself feel okay about where you are today, we need to be continually trying to drive that. And that applies to, again, the customers, the employees. Kill complexity. <laughs> our most, our most um, edgy of our values was actually the one that was almost rejected multiple times as we rolled this out. The organization people said, how can you have kill in a value set? But we talked about, you know, simplicity. Let's make a value called simplicity. And we were like, that sounds so... <laughs> Nice. No, if you work in insurance, you literally have to kill complexity. Because if you've ever seen an insurance form with all the stuff in there, if you just kind of, if you just want to go, let's strive for simplicity, the reality is, is you are not going to get anywhere near where you need to be. 
And so we had, to add, we had to add that intensity because we knew that where we were coming from and where we need to go to from a customer standpoint was so far. At one point, the, the board of directors, they were debating this, so we, we, we launched this with them first, right? We took them through all the experience, you know, we're sitting there, the group executive, we, you know, walked through with them. And they, oh no, you cannot have kill complexity as one of your values, there's just no way. And they went through and they did a whole debate about it and at one point they went out, they went out to dinner afterwards and they were still very like, they, don't know, they didn't like it. And at dinner finally the chairman says, I don't want to kill complexity, I want to murder it. <laughs> they're like, I said, I think we're okay now. <laughs> um, and then finally was create legacy and our CEO, Mark, he likes to say, be a good ancestor. But again, we're a 300 year old company and we're scraping the stuff off the walls from previous generations of leaders. And we see ourselves as temporary guardians of this organization. And, and it, when you do that, you make decisions differently than if you think, okay, well, I just, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna do what I gotta do, quick fixes, and then I'm gonna go. The reality is the fixes had to be at the core. They had to get down, we had to go down to studs, to use a term, you know, renovation term. We had to go down to studs if we were gonna fix it right. And we needed to, to really position that with our employees because that sense of long-term vision that sense of long-term commitment was really lacking and all the data that they provided to us, all the feedback they gave us, was that that was a place they just didn't believe that we were committed. Okay. So a couple of things on talent. You know, it's been interesting as we've gone through this, you know, so I've worked in a number of different industries. I've worked in retail and financial services. And, you know, I used to work for a company called Starbucks. A lot of people know Starbucks, right? Average age is like 30. Okay, if you're lucky, it's 30. Most days, it's 28. 100,000 employees, it's probably 150 or so now at least. Um, and a very fast-moving organization, high growth. And when I got to Aviva, I was you know, trying to get underneath, what's, who's this organization, right? I found people that had been you know, 30 years working for Aviva. 30 years, 30 years. What, did they start when they were 10, <laughs> right? I found an organization where actually my dad worked here and now I'm working here. So our, our actually chief risk officer, his father was the chief actuary for, for Norwich Union, okay? So the organization has this legacy of people that have worked for it, We're, you know, in, our, in different places, in Norwich, in Norwich and in York, we had organizations, we had people that have been there for their whole lives. And what we needed to try and figure out is how do you protect what those people who are long-term committed to the brand and the organization and the customer and have deep technical expertise, how do you protect that? But actually, how do you infuse the organization with talent. And so we started to do a lot of work around understanding the organization. So we did the normal engagement kind of surveys. Then we said, you know what, we're not getting fast enough, deep enough. We're going to do snapshots. So we do snapshots every three months. We start to get in and ask specific questions, start to dive into it. I said, I still don't, still don't have enough to act on and figure out where these pockets are. So what we did is we did a piece of work. We did two pieces of work this year. And we started to correlate different attributes of different groups. So we use the value survey, we use the engagement survey, um, we use performance data, we use years of service, location information. And what we did was we came up with a, a, a group and we worked with a company that helped us correlate what we call tribes. And these tribes are from, actually we're really lucky, we've got engaged champions, so it's good, we've got a, a good group of engaged champions, all the way through to this little, these red, this red group, which is the, the, I think it's called the disengaged, I can't even read it, disengaged um, uh, group. And that group at the very end are the least engaged in the organization, these are the most engaged. But they have very different profiles. So for example, in um, the constrained professional group, actually what we found is that group of people is about 57% women. These are folks that have high performance. Their values are, they want a career, they want to move their career forward but they're highly frustrated because their boss is not helping them develop. And then we could see where they are in the organization. So physically, where are they located? What business units? Where do you have groups of these? And we've started now to start to dive into that to start to solve for what are the challenges? How do we unlock the potential of the organization so that we can move people through? Because unlike many organizations that I've worked for, we had the average age of the middle of our organization was higher than the average age of our group executives. Okay, so you have lots of movement at the front, lots of turnover at the front customer face, lots of movement at the group executive level, no movement in the middle, and older, an older generation at the middle. So the thinking we needed to shift, so we've been working through that. 
So there's lots and lots of data on that. And then the last piece of work that we did, which has been really helpful, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over, we're going to talk about sort of lessons learned, is we've correlated a number of the questions that we ask in our engagement with financial and customer results. And so what we're starting to see is, is so we've got customer promoters, so these are RMPS scores, these are customer detractors. And what we're starting to look at is what are the things, what are the, what are the areas where they score us when our employees score us really high? So one of them is, in these countries, see the high, the high customer detractors versus the low customer detractors. In the, in the countries where we have high customer detractors, we get very low scores on my manager looks to the long term. We have very, it's a highly correlated response on that. So what we know is, is that um, those employees, those managers who look to the long term, who, start to, who do good planning, who engage their teams, actually their teams create a different customer experience and starting to connect the people behavior to the actual business outcomes. Because just like as, a, as an individual, the only thing I can control is myself, as an organization, actually, the thing that you have the most ability to influence and engage with is actually your employees, more so than those customers. So we're starting to drive this kind of conversation a little differently. All right, principles. principles. So, do you want me to keep? Do you oh, want to do, it doesn't off. matter, we can yeah, read them. Okay. So customer from the start. <laughs> so the biggest aha moment for us as an executive team was that exercise, I think, that Atif took us through when we went through and we pretended to be a customer, and then that person who we pr just pretended to be walked in the room. And we realized that the way we think about our products and our services and our experience was very different than the way they did. And so this, this whole journey, and I would encourage, I think in any journey, I've done this a number of different experiences, different country, com companies, had to start with the customer. Uh, the second one is, uh, I don't think we've talked about this, but just leaders have to lead. And not only do they have to lead, they have to have a point of view, right? There are no answers in the disruptive world. You don't know where the market's going to be in five years' time, let alone 10 years' time. You need to develop a point of view, and that's what we did in that first session. So, and, and it's really important leaders do that and have some courage around doing that. Culture and services strategy. You know, you're going to hear a lot of people say to me, oh, what about Google? We have a Google culture. Or, oh, we should go <laughs> look at Apple and have, have an Apple culture. Or, what did you do at Starbucks, you know? And, and that's all, those are all good cultures for their companies. But culture needs to be in service to strategy. And so those are good insights, they're good stimulus. But if you think you're going to just define your culture by somebody else because they seem to be successful, it, it, you, won't, you won't get any traction. Uh, again, it's exploration, not communication. So I, I mean, I have a personal, nothing against comms teams, by the way. But <laughs> I've got a personal mission against comms in businesses. Businesses don't need comms in the modern world. They need conversations about the stuff that we think we need to go and do, and people need to be able to explore it and figure out what it means for them. That's not going to happen in an email, uh, a wall laminate, uh, or a one-hour briefing. You have to make time. And frankly, we know what the cost of not making time is. If you can't pull off the transformation, then Kodak, Blockbusters, et cetera, et cetera, show us what happens. So you know, it's a false economy saying, hey, we can't afford to invest two hours of our people's time or three hours of our people's time on what the future of this business is, uh, you know, it just doesn't really make any sense in the, in the current world. And then the last one is keep it edgy. You know, we, um, I think most of us in, in corporate America, corporate, global corporate environments, think of ourselves as rational beings. We heard a little bit earlier that we're not so rational, right? Um, emotion is the fuel of organizational change. So either you're going to engage in that emotion and you're going to help drive that emotion in a positive energy and a positive force toward what you want to see, or the emotion will just come along and be whatever it is. So emotion is something that often we don't use because we don't want to get emotional because that's a bad thing. But what we found is, is by having that edgy, having that emotion, having that human engagement, what we found is, is we were able to connect as, as an organization, a bunch of people, which would drive the actual outcomes much more effectively and much faster than had we stayed away from the emotion. Because it was there, we just needed, we needed to connect to it. Okay. Double click, I think. All one right, one so one there more. we go. We're going to roll a quick, quick film. This is um, at one just point through the transformation. Oh, did I need to hit it? That's good. It's coming. And I think probably the most significant thing is, is the purpose. I think the, um, you know, it, was, it, was, it was really refreshing to hear 
Matt Wilson talk about, you know, the making money is an outcome, but what are we about? What's our role in society and in, in the community? There's such a good representation of the GE um, members and also the fact that they're so engaged in it. So you really feel like it's come from the heart that they've actually put this together um, themselves. And um, it doesn't feel like a cascade of information. It actually feels like something they want everyone to be behind, um, which is great. I think the kill complexity value and the um care more value is something that from a, an operational point of view is something that we will really really take away. I kind of reacted against it a little bit because there's some negative words in there uh, and uh, I, I, I had to kind of really think through it but having thought through it uh, I really liked it because of that because it's edgy it's a bit different and it's honest and it, it's really what we're about it's we're not Disney we're not Coke we are Aviva we're an insurance company and uh, I think it really says what we're what we're there to do. Thank Good. you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Just a few quick questions. Uh, on a scale of one to five, do your employees understand your organization's vision? Um, I would say that's mixed uh, there. Yeah. No. It was an interesting, actually, an effort that we undertook as part of this was um, there had been some research done that showed that one of the most important factors for organizations achieving their vision was not that they understood the organization's values and, and goals, but that they had clarified their own personal values and goals. So as part of our transformation, what we did before we started to introduce the organization's aspirations, we actually gave an opportunity to every employee to spend a day to look at their own personal values and goals. And that exercise around where do you want to be, what do you want to do, what's important to you, aligning that and then saying, OK, now this is where we're going to go. You want to come along? It was a very powerful transition. So I think a lot of times you spend all this effort communicating your stuff. But actually, if you hear what their stuff is, then you can connect it. And that was, that was a very different approach. It was something that we were very excited about. I imagine there's a bit more engagement where, where people actually feel they're getting something from the yeah. process as opposed to it's something that you're doing to yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look at the, um, the other questions, if we may, just very briefly, um, what questions we want to ask. Can you really prepare existing talent for new roles, or are you best bringing in fresh talent? Do you want to take that? Shall I? Shall I? So I think... I mean, I think the reality is, is well, yeah, not all of them, but some you can. It depends. It's like a factor of what's motivating them personally, the, the point that Christine was just making. Uh, do they really get where we're trying to go, and is that exciting and stretching? I mean, most whenever I've seen surveys done of um, what drives people's fulfillment and happiness at work, complexity is actually number one, right? People always say it's who's your boss. Actually, it's have you got enough complexity in your job? Just enough, the right level. So if they get it and it feels exciting enough, then yeah, they've got some motivation. Um, I, and I think it plays to what Al, uh, Alan was saying about vertical development, right? And are you, help, are you doing your bit? And uh, one of the th conversations we had along the journey was, I'm sort of a believer in you've got to do your bit, right? Like you've got to help them understand where we're going and help put in place the conditions for that vertical development. And then you know whether they're going to be able to shift or not. Most companies end up uh, sort of writing people off before they've really stretched themselves as an organization to put stuff, because this is really hard stuff. I mean, you know, you've got people who've got, and particularly at the top of an organization, they've been there for 20 years, and they've got successful operating a certain way. And you're asking them to unwire how they feel about risk, how they feel about taking a chance on something and then it failing, and rewire themselves. I mean, that's, <laughs> you've got to stretch hard as an organization to put in place the conditions and support to help people do that, and then see who can make the shift. Uh, and then make a judgment about you know, who's going to make it or not make it. Okay, one last question. What's the biggest priority in shifting organizational culture? I know that's very difficult to answer in 30 seconds, but... I, guess I, think that I would say the, the, biggest, the biggest priority is, well, I would say it's, it's two sides of the same coin, which is you've got to know where you are, really honestly, really forthrightly, don't hide, don't shy away from it, really, really, where are you? And we were, by the way, in really bad shape. I'd never seen the level of emotion and disappointment. It was, it, was, it was so personal. And then you've got to know where you're going and, and, and be relentless, audacious, fearless about putting that flag in there and saying, this is where we're going to be. The rest of it, the process, there's no one roadmap. It's more like a butterfly's pattern. 
you know, you're going to go a little bit to the left, and you're going to really, oh, we went too far. We're going to go a little bit to the right. But it's iterative, and I think one of the things that Atif really helped us as an executive team learn is that you're not going to get it right 100% every time. It needs to be live and learn, execute, try, get the feedback, listen, adjust, modify, do the same thing. So culture is the same as anything else in the business world today. There's so much moving around. If you think you're going to put a plan in place and just execute it, put a plan in place, but hold it lightly. <laughs> OK? So okay, that's Christine, what, that's what I Atif, say. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you.